It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. We're talking about the great apostasy in this episode of the Maxwell Institute Podcast. So open up your green hymnals to the first song, which triumphantly exclaims, The morning breaks, the shadows flee. Parley P. Pratt wrote this one. He describes the restoration as a glorious morning following a long, dark night of apostasy when God's church seemed lost from the earth. And since the beginning of the Latter-day Saint movement, Mormons have been captivated by this idea of apostasy, speculating about its nature, its timing, the causes of it, and the results. And various church leaders and scholars have proposed different answers to these questions. But the basic Sunday school version stabilized around the idea that Christ established a church with particular truths and practices, a church that apostatized and then was restored through Joseph Smith. Now, how accurate is this basic story? That's a question a group of LDS scholars recently addressed. They've published a watershed book with Oxford University Press addressing questions about the great apostasy. The book's called Standing Apart, and the editors of the book, Miranda Wilcox and John Young, join me in this episode of the Maxwell Institute podcast to talk about this surprising volume. Miranda Wilcox and John Young have edited the book Standing Apart, Mormon Historical Consciousness and the Concept of Apostasy, and they join me today. John joins us from Florida uh, through Skype. How are you doing, John? Fine, thank you. And Miranda is here with me at the Maxwell Institute. Hello. You've got this book that just came out. I I reviewed it on the Maxwell Institute blog. I did a quick review of it, and I, I said this book is the most important book in Mormon studies that I've read since Richard Bushman's Rough Stone Rolling. And they're different books. One of them's a biography and one of them's uh, a collection of essays. But the reason that I framed it that way is because you're offering sort of a, a different take on, on what apostasy means uh, th- that members of the church might not have encountered before. And similar to what Richard Bushman did with Joseph Smith, introducing them to uh, a Joseph that they that they maybe hadn't encountered before. So I wanna begin by talking about some of the assumptions or beliefs that you both had growing up as Latter-day Saints about the great apostasy, some of the assumptions that a lot of Mormons probably still have. So, Miranda, let's let's start with you. Um, I grew up in Southern California, and I attended you know, the standard church curriculum, um, Sunday school lessons about the great apostasy, slide shows at that point, um, you know, pictures of priests holding sketchy objects and sort of scary music and growing up I didn't really know um, much about the Middle Ages or uh, except what I heard at church and what I heard at church was things were evil and corrupt Um, and as I started my undergraduate program and and fell in love with old English poetry um, I started to study the Middle Ages and began to discover that there were many people who were very um, sincere about their belief in Christ and took great pains to try to articulate their understanding of Christ to each other. And um, they went to great lengths to document their study of the scriptures and manuscripts, which were incredibly time intensive to produce and are testament of the importance of um, transmitting their Christian faith. How about you, John? Does that sort of match up to your experience as well in terms of the things you learned growing up in the church and then what you uh, got at school? Yeah, more or less. I mean, um, I was always fascinated with the Middle Ages when I was growing up. I think it was probably the sword and shield that my brother made me, you know, out of wood when I was little, uh, that got me fascinated in it. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, the seminary, um, uh, sort of narrative of indulgence peddlers and corrupt popes and things like that. And, you know, I just, I, I carried that assumption with me. I remember teaching, uh, the apostasy as a missionary, um, and uh, really wanting to learn about the period so that I could teach the kind of standard narrative of, of apostasy more effectively. I wanted, you know, more stories of, 
of uh, corruption and um, spiritual darkness and, and things like that. And I read, as a missionary, I read uh, James Talmadge's The Great Apostasy and really, I mean, scoured every missionary apartment that I was in for more information. And at that point, I decided that I wanted to study history. Um, and I remember my first uh, semester as, as a, a student of history at Rick's College then, um, I had to do an essay on the concept of just war. And uh, the essay prompt read something like, an, an idea of just war emerged in the Middle Ages. And I, I remember writing, that sounds ridiculous because how could anything just come out of the Middle Ages? Um, <laughs> It was such a corrupt and terrible time in history, and that was how I began that essay. But then I started to really study it. Um, I remember taking a class from Paul Pixton at BYU uh, about the Middle Ages, and and um, somebody asked a question. I think you know, prompted by the uh, the kind of standard apostasy narrative, and he said, "You've been listening to your seminary teacher too much," um, or, or something like that. Um, and at that point, you know, I mean, reading uh, the works of um, especially uh, monks and, and others in the 12th and 13th centuries, um, reading Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, reading Abelard, um, recognizing the complexity and the richness. And there I'm borrowing um, Spencer Young's uh, title of his essay in the book, um, but really the complexity and the richness of the Middle Ages and is, you know, becoming very annoyed at the term dark ages at that point and, you know, following that into grad school, uh, just becoming more and more sort of convinced of the the worth of the people during that period of history. Um, so that's, I think, what led, you know, to the conversations that ultimately led to uh, to this book. So both of you kind of describe an, uh, an experience of going, um, going to school, going to college, going to university and learning more about history that sort of challenged some of the stories that you heard growing up in church or the view that you had of, of what the apostasy meant. Um, is that fair to say? Yeah, for sure. I, I, I was um, working as a research assistant to Eric Dursteller in the BYU History Department yes. my last year as an undergrad, and there was an ensign issue that came out in, I think it was the spring of 99, May, April or May of 99, something like that. And I had a picture of Martin Luther on the cover, and it was, you know, the same kind of standard narrative of uh, uh, the original church, um, and then this, you know, collapse of uh, priesthood authority, uh, descent into darkness, and then, you know, very much the light coming back into the world with the Renaissance and the Reformation and the lionizing of the Reformers. And uh, I remember Dursteller saying, I need to do some investigating and find out when this started, you know, who, who came up with these ideas. And so he asked me as his research assistant to start uh, reading into Mormon authors who had written about the apostasy. And so that uh, research led ultimately to, you know, to him uh, publishing his article. And I won't claim any credit for that. Uh, he's the one who wrote it. Um, but, uh, you know, those conversations really, I mean, I think had a long life, uh, for a lot of us who were involved in this um, in this volume, and that led to Dursteller's article that was published in the Journal of Mormon History in 2002, uh, which was very well received. Um, and a form of that, of course, appears in in Standing Apart. Miranda, you you heard John just a, a second ago. He John talked about how he liked to he, he went into it sort of looking for these really interesting or titillating stories almost. And I, I felt that way too, as I, especially as I read Talmadge's Great Apostasy. There are these great stories in there about popes doing crazy things or, uh, you know, people selling indulgences and doing all these things. And the, the, the word, you know, dark ages was kind of how it was presented. When you started uh, getting more into history, did you have that same kind of a, of may, maybe, I don't want to call it a hope, but maybe an, a, an interest in finding these shadier sides of history that was overturned? Or did you go into it with sort of a different approach to begin with? Um, I went into it not looking for... Um I guess, you know, trying to find evidence to support our narrative. I study Anglo-Saxon England, and Anglo-Saxon England is pretty much ignored in the Mormon narrative completely. Um, there's a lot of broad generalizations that are made about the Middle Ages. 
but if anything they tend to be more focused on say rome or but you know anglo-saxon england is out on the edge of christendom um and it, it doesn't really appear in the narrative so my first encounter with old english the language old english was when i was translating um, elegiac poems um, another poem was called the dream of the root about the finding of the cross and these are deeply spiritual poems that really resonated with me. And so as I wanted to explore a culture that produced this poetry that was so rich and so powerful, um, and that's really what you know led me to the, the Middle Ages was to understand the Anglo-Saxon culture. And then, of course, I learned a lot more about their context in the wider um, continental Western Europe. So let's talk about um, the notion of apostasy, apostasy then. Uh, Miranda, how about you start and, and just talk about what the word means in general, maybe some of its semantic range and how it's used by different people. Well, if we look back in the history of the word, um, its etymology, it's a Greek word. Um, it's an ancient word. It appears, um, you know, long before the New Testament. Um, is actually uh, in two parts. Um, there's um, an adverb meaning away, and then a part of a verb that means standing. So when you put the two parts together, it means standing apart, which is why we titled our book "Standing Apart" in, you know, evoking this etymology. Um, but as far as and I, I, not a Greek scholar, um, but from commentaries, I gathered that apostasy in ancient Greece was usually um, involved in s spatial separation. So when you know people left cities or left families, communities, their actions were apostasy was used to describe, or apostasia was uh, used to describe that kind of um, an action. It was used quite often with respect to a desertion from military units up until the introduction of Christianity. And, you know, at some point, Paul uses it, I think, once or twice in the New Testament. And from that point onwards, it takes on a more religious connotation. And it's not actually, um, so Latin borrows apostasia into Latin, and it's a Greek loan word. But it's not a word that appears frequently in the Latin corpus, medieval Latin Christian corpus, they tend to be more focused on the word heresy. And so... Was there much of a thing of like Christians calling each other apostates or was it... Uh, my impression would be it would be more... They'd be more inclined to talk about heresy than... A They're more inclined to talk about heresy. Occasionally when I did corpus searches in... Um, in, in Latin databases, I would see in the discussion of the sort of heresy orthodoxy, there would be a comment maybe about so-and-so, you know, is an apostate. But the bulk, the majority of the discourse is focused on the word orthodoxy and heresy um, and correctness or incorrectness of belief. Um, because Christianity pretty much was the only alternative for most of Western Europe. I mean, there were people who, Christians who did convert to Judaism and maybe were considered apostates, but that was, and John can actually talk more about that, um, a fairly rare occurrence, I think, so. Yeah, go ahead, John, uh, same question to you. Well, I mean, Miranda uh, certainly did, I think, the legwork on the, the etym etymological um, you know, origin of the word. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know, we're, I think in the church, we, there, there are enough of astute scholars who have now, you know, uh, informed us that the, the word has connotations of rebellion. And I think that that uh, is important um, for understanding apostasy. There are certainly evidences uh, in uh, the New Testament, I was just looking in the in the Vulgate here on, you know, for the uh, translation of the word apostasia uh, into Latin, it's discessio, um, uh, which has the same kinds of connotations. But um, uh, th th there were rebellions, of course, that you know there were those who rejected um, uh, and stood apart from uh, the church. And uh, but th but you know we're dealing with a very complex and and rich. Um, and uh, variegated uh, Christianity in those early centuries, as some of the essays in the volume uh, discuss, um, and it's it's very quickly I think replaced by 
uh, by heresy. Um, the question is, uh, for Mormons reading apostasy, is how do we understand apostasy you know, as it occurred, uh, given that we the church leaders from the time of Joseph Smith have taught that uh, Christianity had fallen into corruption that, you know, and, and began to use the word apostasy. Um, you know, how do we understand the word apostasy in our own theology? Um, and, uh, you know, I think that there's, there's abundant, uh, information in Mormon scripture, uh, in especially the book of Mormon, but in, in the Pearl of Great Price as well in other places, um, that, Indicate that there is some nuance to the word uh, for for Mormon theology. Um, I wanted to ask you about that specifically concerning Joseph Smith's first vision narrative, John. This this has become a key text in our scriptural canon, obviously. So Joseph Smith recorded a few different versions of the first vision, but I think each of them include the idea that God was displeased with the state of uh, religion in in eighteen twenty ish, and it, and it uses blunt language. Um, uh, Joseph reports uh, God saying their creeds are an abomination, things like this. I mean, and it sounds pretty straightforward. It seems pretty, you know, pretty blanket. Uh, so, so talk about uh, how how that kind of a statement in our scripture uh, stacks up with other scriptural statements in terms of maybe modifying such a blanket view of what apostasy means. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean uh, the. I think the word creed is important there, and other scholars have worked on this. I think Jack Welch uh, spent some time on this in the in the uh, uh, volume that was done, the Early Christians in Disarray volume. Um, but uh, you know, we have to think about what Joseph would have understood by creeds in the early 19th century. Um, probably not the Nicene Creed or the Creed of Constantinople or any of the early Christian creeds necessarily. Um, and so he singles out creeds, uh, probably the Protestant creeds uh, that were more recent, you know, from the from the Reformation period. That's that may be what Joseph would have understood by creed. Um, but yeah, there is strong language in the first vision narrative. And, you know, I mean, the 1838, which is the canonized account, of course, um, uh, you know, it talks in fairly stark terms about um, the followers of religion being all wrong together, um, and that the, their creeds are an abomination, that they have um, a, uh, a sort of, they strive for godliness, but they fall short for a variety of reasons. And so, yeah, the language is strong. But if we juxtapose that with um, the way that apostasy is presented in the Book of Mormon, or the way that apostasy is presented in the um, uh, the account of Enoch in the Pearl of Great Price, for instance, we see that promises are still very much extended to those who live in an apostate condition. Uh, the Lamanites, you know, uh, the Lord says repeatedly in the Book of Mormon to various, through various Nephite prophets that um, the Lamanites are still chosen Israel, um, that the prom that you know the promises that were made will be restored to them eventually. And moreover, um, and maybe even an even more important point is that it wasn't their fault, that it was the originators, um, what medieval Christians, what Dante, for instance, would have called the arch heretics, the the ones who formulated the heresy or the ones who formulated the apostasy are the ones to blame, that those who inherit those conditions are not culpable for the conditions that they live in. Um, and then, you know, less, I think, um, clear, but there are certainly hints that these people are, are capable of great righteousness. Um you know, we have stories in the in the Book of Mormon of people like Abish, who somehow, you know, she and her father become converted uh, to the Lord, and and you know, she eventually recognizes the Nephite missionaries who were sent uh, for what they are, um, but they became converted independently uh, uh, of those missionaries, of you know, people who uh, had the, the true authority or whatever we want to call it, um, and so people who live in conditions of apostasy are capable of. Righteousness, and that I think squares with what Miranda and I have been talking about. That you know, these people we encounter in the Middle Ages, whether in Anglo-Saxon poetry or in you know 12th-century spirituality, 
uh, were close to God, that they um, they did have truth, that they were inspired in some ways. And I think that, that Mormon theology leaves open that possibility. Uh, our, our scripture certainly does. And so, you know, I mean, we have these these various texts that are juxtaposed with each other. Um, and uh, it's our job, I think, as, you know, as members of the church to try to make sense of all of that and try to figure out what it what it means for us. That's John Young. I'm joined by John and Miranda Wilcox, the two scholars who just edited the book Standing Apart. It's a book about the great apostasy in Mormon history and the ways that Mormons understand the apostasy. The book's epilogue uh, was written by Terrell Givens, and, and he argues that Joseph Smith's conception of the apostasy was somewhat different from the sort of apostasy narrative that uh, that we might hear at church today. Um, so, Miranda, will you take a, a moment to sort of describe uh, Givens' perspective on that, and then I have a follow-up question to that. Givens describes uh, Joseph Smith as being very optimistic about the past, that he looks to the past as a source of truth and knowledge, and of course recognizing that the truth might have been fragmented or scattered across the centuries, but he looks um, to lots of different sources, um, the ancient Hebrew um, Israelite religions, um, he's looking to um, Luther, he's looking to um, how much he knows about the Middle Ages. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody's really done a lot of study on that, um, but I mean, we do know that he looks into Masonic traditions as well. So he's he's looking at or f- you know into ancient practices and ancient spiritual ideas, and he's trying to find and bring together the truth that. Um, um, that, you know, has been passed down through the, the centuries and the ages. And Givens describes Joseph as gathering um, these truths together, bringing them together into a whole again, uh, combined with the new revelation that he's receiving from God and being able to integrate them into, you know, this new religious tradition that he's starting. Um, but that's this tradition is very much rooted um you know, into the through the past, um, and, and it's not a rupture with the past, but it grows out of the past, um, and and is sort of, um, I guess, like a seed or something that's you know just been waiting to get some water, and it just grows up out of the past um, into this new plant and flourishes. Um, and he um, refers to the scripture in Revelations describing um, the woman lost in the wilderness um, as the woman in the wilderness survives and she is sheltered in the wilderness. She like represents the church. And she represents the church. And so um, so he has, and he describes how important this um, scripture about the woman in the wilderness is to Joseph and how he comes to realize that he's, involved in this work of bringing the woman out of the wilderness, the church out of the wilderness, you know, and and this is very important for his prophetic self-understanding. So the follow-up to that for either of you, um, maybe John, you can touch on this, is this this view of, of the apostasy, according to, to Givens, uh, it, it seems really useful for people who are interested in building bridges between different faiths, in, in learning from other faiths, in recognizing um, good things uh, f- from other religions and other traditions. So what, what, what's your response to someone who might say that that interpretation seems m- more like wishful thinking, uh, more than like an actual reflection of, of Joseph Smith's perspective on it? W- what would you say in response to that? Well, I think that what Givens has given us is a really interesting and um, useful way of thinking about our own identity. Whether we follow that up and, you know, actually build any bridges is, is another thing. Um, I hope that that happens, certainly. But um, if we are to understand, as, you know, in the, the, t- the proof text, or the text that he uses as evidence here uh, seem to indicate that Joseph understood this. Um, if we are to understand that the Mormon church, the LDS church, was not created ex nihilo, uh, or you know, as, as it was often taught, um, you know, it was not uh, a tree that was uprooted and then a new tree planted, um, 
Uh, I remember that story being shared uh, with you know, from various teachers when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that it survived, and that you know God's inspiration remained with people, and that the project of restoration was really a gathering of a variety of strands uh in you know using a variety with the lord using a variety of people who each had a a perspective you know whether they came from the baptists or from the methodists or from the campbellites or uh you know whatever their their uh, faith of uh, of origin or today you know whether they you know they come from a, a non-religious background or something like that 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 uh, restoration really is a way of bringing all perspectives together. Um, and I think that that's not a lesson just for the uh, 1830s and 40s, but that, you know, as, as Latter-day Saints, we might take that as a sort of call for, uh, you know, how, how we might perceive other people, um, how, how we might uh, recognize that the perspective provided by um, somebody who is uh, a Catholic or is a Muslim or is a Jew can be really valuable for us. Um, I remember being shocked, especially as a graduate student, reading medieval texts and saying, these people understand this stuff a whole lot better than I do. <laughs> they understand basic doctrines of uh, the Christian gospel or you know, religious truths a whole lot better than I do. And, and being shocked that they did understand that. And, and after a while... I ceased to be shocked and decided instead to learn from these people. Yeah, I think sometimes approaching people of the past, we bring a little bit of modern arrogance along with us, I think, to that enterprise. And it's easy to forget uh, that these weren't just these you know, poor, unfortunate souls who lived in the dark and, <laughs> and, and didn't quite understand what was going on. Um, so I think well, that studies like this really can help inject more humility in, in the way that we approach the past. I remember attending my um, uh, my parents were the ward I grew up in uh, maybe four or five years ago. And, um, you know, the Sunday school teacher asked, so what did people know about, and I forget which doctrine it was, or what did people know about the gospel of Jesus Christ before Joseph Smith restored it? And somebody piped up and just said, practically nothing. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I, I'm not certainly going to fault anyone for for having that perspective. That's simply the way that we're taught. But uh, you know, I just I wanted to get out um, some texts from the Middle Ages. You know, I wanted to get out some Dante and say, really, <laughs> Dante <laughs> did not understand, was not inspired in some way uh, in writing the Divine Comedy. The author of the Dream of the Rood, uh, as Miranda alluded to earlier, uh, you know, did not have a really um, developed spirituality and understood some important things about the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, it's simply not the case. And, and these are people we can learn from. And, and what that indicates is we can learn from peoples of other faiths in a variety of ways. And I think that we need to pursue that sort of thing. Yeah. One of the real benefits, I think, from reading this book is getting uh, getting familiar with the past in a new way and and realizing that that we have actually have quite a bit to learn about uh, about our forebears. I want to zoom out a little bit and talk about this idea that you bring up in the introduction about historical consciousness. So let's talk about this idea. This is an interesting concept uh, that kind of comes up throughout the book. So Miranda, um, what is historical consciousness? Why is that a framing device that you brought to this particular book? Um, <laughs> well, there's... <laughs> different ways of defining historical consciousness if you look at contemporary historians. Um, I looked at, or the, I guess the people, the scholars that resonated with me were um, typically religious scholars, uh, many of them Catholic, but some of evangelical persuasion, who have been r- writing for probably the last 15 or so years about how do we write about faithful people in the past, whether we're of the same confessional tradition as those people, or even if we're not of the same confessional tradition, how do we respect their faith in a way that's authentic and in a way that doesn't colonize them in a way that doesn't um, um, 
you know, doubt them. What do you mean colonize them? That's a really interesting phrase. I think that's an important... Well, I think we have a tendency, um, people in the present have a tendency to look into the past and say, oh, well, we see something that looks a little bit familiar or looks parallel to what we do today. And so we assume that they must have understood things the same way that we do or must have done things the same way that we do. And so... Taylor Petrie talks about this in his chapter where he looks at, you know, the first, the church in the first century, Christ's church. And he says, well, we often will see words um, in the New Testament that are still words that we use today. And he uses the word apostle. But he actually goes through and he says, according to contemporary scholarship of of the first century, um, the people who were called apostles were not um, didn't operate in the same way that Mormon apostles do today. And so he says we tend to conflate the present and the past um, with just these, you know, hints of, of similarity. And so I think these historians um, are trying to develop an ethical way of writing history um, that takes into account um, the even as we're finding similarities that we're also need to be respectful of the differences and and not conflate things that aren't true, but try to be as authentic as we can to the experience of the people of the past. And um, I also looked at the work of David Tracy, who's a theologian at the University of Chicago, or was, he might be retired now, um, but he um, writes about less about the past, but more about engaging in ecumenical interactions. And he talks about the necessity for there being empathy in the process, but also reflective as well as critical engagement um, with the process and that it needs to be authentic on both sides, that people need to sort of enter into this um, encounter with the other um, with take, willing to take the risk of being changed by it. Um, and I thought that was a really important thing to try to convey is that when we study history, we our perspective of who we are in the present changes. And if we're so scared <laughs> of changing, then we can, and we're just so fixed that what we have today is right and the only way that things have ever been done, then we really miss out on the opportunity to learn from the past and potentially maybe avoid some of their mistakes. Because um, as I study religious culture, um, monasticism, um, creedal discourse and so forth, you know, there were problems. Um, and when you study the interactions of um, of nuns in a group, in a convent, or monks in a monastery, there were interpersonal problems, there were political problems. There were lots of hard things. And I think as Mormons, we understand this because we work in wards and wards are hard, right? There's a lot of personalities to sort of manage. There's a lot of responsibilities to divvy out. And so I think as we like try to make sense of our, our own sort of the complexities of our own religious life that we can look and see how things maybe went right and maybe how things didn't go so well and maybe we can avoid some of those things happening if we're at least aware of the, the, that you know that potential so if I might chime in very briefly here I, I think that I mean what what we realized as this project began to come together was that we were really talking about how we frame our own identity and a large part of identity is how we shape the past how we understand the past and so i think that the concept or the the, the term historical consciousness really arose from that that you know uh whether our view of the past you know uh is accurate or um jives with the historical record or not the perception we have of the past is a very important marker of who we are. And it's a problem, I think, when the understanding of the historical record, um, and this is not to say that professional historians get it right all of the time, uh, but when you know the kind of general understanding of the historical record begins to move beyond the narratives that we have 
uh, latched hold onto um, that have become a part of our identity. Um, you know, do we then say, well, I don't care what the historical record says, or I don't care what these under what these new understandings, the, the revisionist understandings are. Um, I'm going to continue to hold on to this, or do we then say, well, maybe there's room in my theology, in my own concept of identity, in my own consciousness, for new ways of thinking about this. Narratives, I mean, history is not just history. You know, his, history is not just something that is entirely self-evident. History is narrative, which is subjective and open to a variety of interpretations. Mm -hmm. And we have to acknowledge that, respect that uh, about history, um, and then do our best to get it right. And if the narratives we're telling are not right, then perhaps we need to open up our minds and, and, and think about that and, and recognize that, you know, there, there are a variety of options out there for telling new narratives. And I think what? what we try to get out in the introduction is that, you know, we have these models of narratives and maybe, you know, we can look at these other models of narratives and, and uh, start to reconstruct our narrative in ways that are, are more true to uh, what the historical record tells us now. One thing that you mentioned that was interesting is sort of the role of scholars in the process. So this is an interesting issue for Latter-day Saints in particular because this understanding of history also has theological implications, right? So it, it affects the way that we view the church. It affects our interpretation of the restoration itself, which is a key component of, of LDS teaching. So there's sort of a theological question that arises here that concerns the respective roles of, of scholars, of church leaders, uh, of apologists, and of regular members of the church. Um, I'm interested to hear uh, you both, Miranda, you uh, go ahead, how, how, how you see these roles sort of shaking out when it comes to a book like this. Well, as we were putting together the book proposal, one of the sections of the proposal asked for a summary of previous scholarship on the topic and to then a statement about how we were going to make a contribution with respect to the previous scholarship. And so as we started to go through and document previous books about Mormon conceptions of historical apostasy. Uh, we found that there were a group of books that were published around the turn of the century. So this is late 1800s, beginning first 20 years of the 1900s, by um, primarily um, general authorities, apostles, um, one um, future president of the church. And they were well, Talmadge was a geologist, so, I mean, he was a scholar, not necessarily a historian. Um, B.H. Roberts was, you know, an amateur historian, very well read. Um, and then um, Joseph um, Fielding Smith is the church historian from a very young age, um, didn't really receive um, a lot of specific training as a historian, but spent his whole life working in the historian, well, much of his decades of his life working in the church historian's office. So we have this group of, you know, the, where church leaders and scholars are sort of not separated in the, you know, early 20th century who are, you know, who are writing foundational books about the great apostasy and their long books get distilled down into a, a, a pretty um, direct, distinct narrative by the middle of the 20th century, um, you know, and then that just takes off during correlation because it's very easy, portable um, to, to spread throughout the church. Um, but then there were, you know, several books. Uh, when well, McConkie um, writes quite um, with quite a bit of polemic um, in Mormon doctrine and several other of his writings. And One of the best is the cross reference he did in Mormon doctrine, where it, uh, I think it said Catholic Church and then it said see the great and abominable Church or something like that. Yeah. Like he took the time to <laughs> to put that in, in, in there. the first edition. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that gets taken out in the second edition, uh -huh. but you hear that as a very common interpretation um, of those passages in Nephi. <laughs> so, um, passage in uh, in. Uh, new witness for the articles of faith or whichever book it was that 
It was a dark and abysmal night. The stench of spiritual death, you know, corrupted the nostrils of, or, or something like that. So, I mean, using <laughs> Very this poetic. Thing, yeah. Um, and also, you know, working uh, another, we have another scholar who writes quite a bit about the apostasy um, in the 70s, 80s, into the 90s, um, Hugh Nibley. Um, and he he is bringing his scholarly background. Um, um, you know, he studies the ancient, um, uh, I guess, ancient Palestine, Egypt, um, the beginnings of Christianity, and he brings all of his linguistic talents and, and knowledge to bear on really trying to um, support the existing church's narrative. And so he's doing what John was trying to do on his mission. He's trying to find as many examples as he can from as many sources as he can to show evidence of corruption and of um, twisting or changing of doctrines or of mistranslation and so forth. And, and you know, he compiles that and publishes um a number of work. And so I think by the, the, the late 20th century, um, the narrative is so well established, not only in the church curriculum, but also, you know, we have a scholar of the caliber of Nibley, you know, who's provided all of this evidence that people aren't really questioning the narrative anymore. And there's actually, if you look at the general conference talks, there's um, a decrease in the reference to the great apostasy narrative in the late in, in the 1990s, it's just not, you know, everybody, I'm assuming, is taking it for granted. But the beginning of the 21st century, there's this resurgence of interest. And I think there's a couple of things happening. Um, you know, most recently, there's been the um, anniversary of the King James Bible. And so people are kind of interested, okay, why are we still using the King James Bible? How does this, you know, and so there's this interest in the Reformation. Um, so also the, Mormon, the Mormon discovery of William Tyndale, I think, happens around the late 1990s, um, mm -hmm. and he becomes kind of this, you know, proto proto restorationist in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Wilcox publishes his book on Tyndale, and and uh, you know he becomes this you know, an almost Mormon saint, as it were, mm -hmm. uh, somebody who is talked about frequently in general conference as, as an example. Yeah, so then there's there's a series of books that are published in the early 21st century um, by um, general authorities, not necessarily apostles, but members of the 70, who um, are not professional historians, um, but who are writing for a more pastoral purpose. Um, and and so they basically go through and support the narratives. Are they adding anything new to that, or are they just sort of going back to the same sources, like going back to Talmadge and going back They're to going these? They're going back to Talmadge. It's very circular. If, if you look at the footnotes and the endnotes, it's mm -hmm. very circular. They're going back to B.H. Roberts. They're going back to Talmadge. They're going and back they to were going Smith. back to, like, Protestant, anti-Catholic yeah. stuff. They, weren't, they were also borrowing as well, so... Yeah. On, on the other hand, I mean, Alexander Morrison's book, which comes out in, what, 2005 or something like that, called uh, Turning from Truth, uh, I think he must have read Eric Dursteller's article in Journal of Mormon History, uh, because he says, and I think he even quotes from some of the same sources that Dursteller uses, um, uh, maybe R.W. Southern or something like that, where he says, you know, we need a new understanding uh, the Middle Ages were not as dark as we've assumed they were. We need a new understanding. But then, yeah, he goes back largely to Talmadge. Uh, he goes back to some of the sources that Talmadge uses. Um, at one point, he says, uh, he quotes um, Lawrence uh, von Mosheim, uh, who is the 18th century ecclesiastical historian, uh, who, you know, Talmadge and, and Roberts use extensively. Um, and he, he puts something in there about uh, Mosheim, who... Uh, was a an upstanding scholar, a well-respected scholar of history. Yeah, well, he was a well-respected scholar of history in the 18th century. Right. Um, and so, I mean, they, they, we've continued, I think, in, in, in apologetics to use the same works um, to maybe begin to shift the narrative a little bit and appreciate people who lived during the time of apostasy Um but ultimately reach the same theological and largely historical conclusions about those periods. So we pretty much realize that we have several groups of people who have written about Mormon concepts of the apostasy. Um, we have 
ecclesiastical leaders who are writing from a pastoral perspective or an institutional perspective. We have a group of um, Mormon scholars writing for apologetics purpose. And, and then occasionally there was sort of a member who wrote a book or, you know, was interested and started doing some research and just wanted to share. Um, but we found that other than Eric Durstroller's piece um, and there was sort of, there was a discussion group um, among BYU faculty that led to um, early Christians in disarray. And I, I think that was kind of this desire to start thinking or rethinking the narrative. So one of the limitations, of, as much as that book made leaps forward in sort of rethinking um, the, early, the early Christian period, because it was just focused on looking at early Christianity, was that the scholars involved in that project weren't, for the most part, specialists in early Christianity. And and so they were writing out sort of outside of their disciplinary training. And so one of the things that we wanted to do with our book was gather a group of people who were going to be writing about the discipline that they were trained in, that they're experts in, and so that we wanted them to bring that scholarly expertise to bear on providing insights into that historical period, not just as sort of general scholars, outsiders kind of looking into the discipline, but actually, you know, in that discipline, um, kind of saying, okay, as a member of this discipline, this is kind of what we can say as Mormons as well. Um, And so I think that's where we situate our book is, is that here we are as Mormon scholars um, trying to contribute from our, our disciplinary training. Mm -hmm. That's Miranda Wilcox. Uh, She and John Young are joining us today on this episode. They edited the book Standing Apart, Mormon Historical Consciousness, and the Concept of Apostasy. One of the things I like about the book is it's sort of got two parts. And the first part sort of talks about the history of Mormon discussions of apostasy, right? So you, there, are, there are chapters that talk about the development of LDS narratives of apostasy and how those aren't static, how those weren't, weren't necessarily claimed to have been revealed, that they're adaptable, that they borrow, and that they can change. So you kind of set that idea up in part one. And then in part two, the book zooms in further to discuss Um, some of the drawbacks to the current popular apostasy narrative. And it also offers some alternative ways of talking about apostasy and and restoration. So, so John Young, can you take a minute to pick one or two of your favorite chapters uh, and and describe those, some, some of the standout pieces? Uh, Well, I mean, we mentioned um, uh, Taylor Petrie's article earlier, and uh, Mm -hmm. I think that that's a real um, blockbuster piece, uh, in the in the book, at least that's that's been very well received uh, by a lot of people, um, by the reviewers in particular uh, at Oxford University Press who looked at it. Um, one that I particularly enjoy as a medievalist, of course, is uh, Spencer Young's piece, um, uh, because and I mean I remember talking to Spencer at the conference we held. It was sort of a working conference, trying to work through the ideas that you know ultimately ended up in the book. Um, uh, but he, he decided that he was going to try to deal with the topic of the selling of indulgences. Um, he said, you know, I just went to the, the, uh, piece of evidence or the theme that more than any other, you know, is viewed as evidence of apostasy. This is basically people who can sort of like pay their way out of a sin, right? It's like paid repentance yeah. sort of Well, thing. that's, you know, uh, that was the topic, I think, that uh, I remember Paul Pixton saying, you've been listening to your seminary teacher too much. Right. So. And that's what I learned. I remember learning it specifically on my mission, this idea that they were out, oh, you could do all sorts of things, pay and be absolved of that sin. How, you know, wow. You know? Well, and I, I think that, you know, what, what uh, Spencer did with that is show that this is motivated by the same um, empathy that we are supposed to feel when we do family history, right? These are people who are doing work in, from their the, the, from their perspective will provide salvation for their deceased relatives. The, that's the doctrinal basis for this. Were there abuses of it? Yes. 
But, um, you know, are there abuses of family history? Um, I think that, you know, we've got plenty of uh, sort of high profile cases to, you know, the Holocaust victims being baptized for the dead and, and other things to show that, you know, there can be abuses by by well-meaning people all around, uh, probably. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's a piece that I particularly enjoy as, as a medievalist. But I think everyone has has definite strengths. Um, uh, Jonathan Green's piece on um, uh, revelation, you know, sort of continuing revelation, the concept of, of revelation and prophecy in the early modern period, um, you know, I think shows that uh, we have a kinship with um, a variety of religious peoples from the past, though, as he says, these, these might be people who were um, disrespected, uh, as he says, friends in low places, you know. Um, uh, I think that uh, David Peck's piece on Islam, we wanted um, uh, at least one article that would cover uh, thinking about apostasy relative to a non-Christian perspective. Mm-hmm. And I think that um, his his term uh, binary logic, the binary logic of apostasy is uh, especially important, um, that this becomes a uh, a situation where we are right and you are wrong, and there's really no uh, alternative to that. Um, and you know, uh, David goes through the uh, some passages in the Quran uh, to show that there are perspectives that we might adopt from uh, other religious traditions that will help us understand that there is there is an alternative to binary logic. Um, that we don't need to think about apostasy in binary terms. That, uh, you know, and I think that that dovetails nicely with um, some of the things that Gibbon says in the epilogue uh, about restoration being a kind of ingathering um, of religious traditions rather than a complete break from uh, from the past. So John named a, a few there. Miranda, are there, are there any other ones that stuck out to you that you really liked? Yes. Like asking which of your children is... Uh, I know. I mean, we we uh, have sort of nurtured all of the chapters along for the last couple of years, so it's hard to single them out. Um, but I was really fascinated with Christopher Jones and Stephen Fleming's discussion. They went back to the, the writings of Joseph Smith, um, Parley P. Pratt, um, and also they looked at... Um, diaries and in a, a wider variety of, of documentary records than have typically been looked at. And Christopher Jones was bringing his interest in Methodism. And he um, concludes that, or they, they conclude that really there's not a set narrative, um, that there's sort of at least two major perspectives among the early uh, Mormon converts. One, that their previous religious tradition had prepared them to become Mormon, and so they kind of took the best part of what they knew before and just added to it um, with the revelation um, that was coming to Joseph Smith and um, the scriptures and the the new ordinances. And there was also um, a strong strain among the early converts of rejecting their previous traditions. So I was fascinated to find that there was um, a balance between these two perspectives of wanting to build on their past, to tr- you know, and have been converts. I mean, they it wasn't just we're rejecting other, but we're rejecting who we were, you know. So, but th- th- there, it wasn't an outright rejection. Um, of other traditions. So it was a much more complicated story than I think we uh, we, we tend to focus in on that first vision narrative um, and that one sentence in the first vision narrative about, you know, all the, the creeds are corrupt and so forth. And 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 so I really like the way that they um, complicated that that um, that perspective and, and showed in the writings of many of these early members that um, there was a, a wider variety of, of perspectives about um, other religious traditions. Um, um, I also appreciated Matt Gray um, talking about how so much of the narrative that we tell about the intertestamental period um, is very derivative of um, Protestant polemical uh, work that was done in the 18th and 19th centuries, and he documents this very thoroughly. 
Um, you know, and and I think um, and many a Mormon home has uh, Alfred Adersheim on its bookshelf, and mm-hmm. that's something that we still draw. I have it. I have several of his books. You know, um, but we have to realize that, that came from a time and a place that is that we've moved far beyond. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think just you know being aware of the fact that Talmadge was drawing well primarily Talmadge and Jesus the Christ, you know, was drawing on scholarship that, you know, maybe was a, a little bit outdated when he was drawing on it, but it's a lot outdated now. Mm-hmm. But we've stayed really, uh, our, our tradition has been so conservative that, you know, we're still treating Talmadge's sources as if they're sort of cutting edge history. And, and, and they're just not anymore. And so he offers a lot of corrective and he also points out um, a lot of the anti-Semitic biases um, of Talmadge's sources and says, you know, we, we probably can let this go. <laughs> right. Um, and, and that, because Mormons have tended to be quite friendly toward Judaism, it, it seems to make sense that we can sort of, you know, let that part of the narrative kind of die away. So, um, if I might say, uh, Miranda's essay is my personal favorite. Um, she won't, she, I'm sure she won't say it herself. <laughs> but um, I think that she gives us uh, so much to think about um, in terms of, you know, the way that we construct narratives, um, the way that narrative forms our identity, and the options we have for a narrative that remains true to our core beliefs but at the same time helps us to, uh, I think, be more responsive to others and, you know, uh, gives us possibilities for being more ecumenical in the way we approach people of other religions. Um, that that piece, I think, is maybe the most challenging of the book, but at the same time offers the, the greatest rewards. It certainly did that for me. One of the questions I have that sort of revolves around that, just, again, we, we come back to this idea of the way that history helps shape identity, is the idea that, that this book in that way sort of does theological work as well as historical work. In other words, it, the stories that it tells also reflect on the ways that Latter-day Saints might understand their religious beliefs that or, or change their religious beliefs. Um, so I'm interested to hear... Uh, Miranda, if you'll expand on this distinction between theology and history and how you see it uh, as playing out in this book, if if it if if you see it as a book that does theological work, if that was um, a side effect or if that was uh, an intended effect or or what was what was the situation? Well, uh, John and I are not theologians, <laughs> trained theologians. We're both trained medievalists, but I guess in the period of well, in the medieval period, there's really not a, a distinction between theology and history because every history was deemed as um, the plan of salvation. Or, you know, medieval um, people believed that that history was a revealed God and our relationship to God. And I think as Latter Day Saints, we're very similar. We see history um, as unfolding in a, a plan in an ordered way we teach about a pre-existent life we teach about mortality we teach about a post-existent life we call this a plan of salvation we're we're very invested in history theologically and so um, I guess if we're writing about history and historical consciousness I don't think there's a way to not um, address theological issues, and I'm not sure that we can really separate theology and history. I think Richard Bushman said, for Mormons, history is theology, or someone said that about one of his books, but I think that's true, um, that when we make historical claims, we're also making theological claims. So if that's the case, then it seems like there, that there is a little bit more at stake when Latter-day Saints write a book like this, there, there's a little bit more at stake because it does have uh, implications for the faith. So was there any felt anxiety on the part of you or John or the contributors uh, of, of needing to be careful in the types of things that are discussed or any sense that, it, that the book would come across as challenging something or be misunderstood in that way? 
Uh, the, the answer is yes. <laughs> there's um, there is a considerable amount of anxiety. Um, I, you know, I'm a faculty member at BYU, and um, that puts me in a in a particular situation where um, I have um, professional loyalties to the church, um, um, as well as um, you know, being a member of the Latter Day Saint Church, and so um, I was in communication with administration and so forth um, to make sure that everybody was aware and clear of you know what kind of project we were working on, so it wouldn't take anybody by surprise. Um, I think the contributors um, felt anxiety as well. Um, and it depended on their personal situation as to the type of anxiety for some. It was professional anxiety about being faculty members at a church institution. Um, for others, it was responses um, um, or the fact that we were presenting new ideas or even re-envisioning historical narratives is a challenging to to many Latter-day Saints. And um, and so, we, yeah, there, there was some pushback and some um, criticism and some questioning about our motivations and um, and so I, it, it, it was definitely a, a part of the project that we had to work through carefully. What about you, John? Well, I think at the same time, I think I felt a lot less anxiety than Miranda did. Um, maybe because I don't, you know, I'm not employed by BYU uh, or anything like that, but I know what motivates me to do this kind of work. And it's the same thing that motivates me, you know, uh, I think to serve in church callings that I might have or um, to do my own personal family history work or to go to the temple or anything I do as a Latter-day Saint. And that is, you know, I was motivated really by love for the people that I study. Um, you know, I think in, in we have a... Uh, room, um, a, a, a particular place for that in Mormon theology. We talk about the spirit of Elijah. We talk about uh, the salvation for the dead. Um, and I've felt, since I started studying history, of tremendous responsibility to speak for those who have passed on and to get their story right. Um and, you know, I mean, my personal belief is that I'll be accountable to to these people that I write about someday. Um, you know, but, but regardless of that, I mean, there, there's a responsibility that goes along with that. And I felt that we were fulfilling that responsibility here, that um, telling the right story about the past is a resp- is a, a religious responsibility that I have as a Latter-day Saint, Um and uh, when we don't tell the story uh, properly of, of our ancestors, I think, you know, there, there's an accountability there, at least theologically within Mormonism, there's an accountability to them. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I, I sensed through the entire project, through the conference that we had, through the communication we had with all of the authors, through the extensive discussions and editing that Miranda and I did together, um, usually from a distance, but uh, together on this, um, you know, that that was exactly what was motivating everyone here, that no one had an axe to grind. No one was trying to undermine LDS theology. No one was trying to undermine the church or, or uh, you know, to tell um, general authorities that their perspectives were wrong or, or something like that. It was motivated entirely by uh, the same kinds of things that we're supposed to be motivated by, um, that, that we felt uh, the, this responsibility to those who came before us. Now, how about um, when it comes to uh, working on a Mormon topic? And Mormon studies is sort of an academic subfield that's becoming uh, a bit more popular these days. Um, but for some other disciplines like biblical scholarship, uh, Mormonism, you know, isn't seen on as playing on the same level, right? So, were there any professional concerns um, in in terms of uh, scholars who are working on a Mormon topic, and uh, how did how did you negotiate with those concerns in terms of framing this book for uh, a Mormon and non-Mormon audience? That's where I felt the anxiety, to be perfectly honest. I mean, yeah. I'm a medievalist. Uh, I'm trying to you know publish in journals that, that cover uh, medieval history, and here I am working on a you know a book about Mormonism. Um, 
which, I mean, Miranda and I are both relatively recent PhDs, both relatively recent, you know, uh, recently into the, uh, into the, into our jobs, um, and with, uh, responsibilities or, or requirements to publish in our fields. Um, and so, you know, I mean, I think we both for those who, uh, are over us for our, our deans or, or our department chairs or whatever had to say, well, this, this does have something to do with the middle ages, <laughs> um, <laughs> that we're really, you know, doing uh, really, uh, medieval scholarship here. Um, though, you know, intended, I guess, for, uh, an audience that is kind of non-traditional in that way. Um, and so I, I did feel some anxiety, but I, I think that, and I'm so glad that there is a venue for this, that Oxford University Press sees value in a project like this, that, um, you know, there are scholars out there who, in trying to understand Mormonism or trying to understand um, uh, religious identity in general, can look at this book and say, this is how one religious tradition makes sense of its history and here are scholars who recognize that there are drawbacks to that, that there are limitations to that, that there may be other perspectives that can be adopted. Um, and, you know, thankfully, OUP saw fit that, uh, to, to publish this and, and you know, it can reach um, uh, the variety, I think, of audiences that we intended, not only members of the church, though we, we certainly hope members of the church will read this and think about their own understanding of apostasy and uh, maybe make room for um, a more generous reading of the past, but um, you know there there are scholars out there of um, uh, of Mormonism, both LDS and non LDS, and and uh, scholars of religious history more and more generally who can um, who can use this book and and uh, that would be helpful for them. Miranda, do you have something on that too? Well, I think one of our hopes is is that the book would be helpful to non-LDS audience, whether they're professional, whether they're, they're, you know, whether they're sort of professionally interested in Mormonism or just curious about Mormonism, because I think Mormons have presented such an exclusive view of ourselves in the American public realm um, over the last hundred plus years that this book explains that relationship and the tensions in that relationship Mm -hmm. in a way that I think might help um, non-members understand kind of where we were coming from, Um, but I think also might help ourselves to understand where we're coming Mm -hmm. from. And so hopefully that will be maybe the beginning of building some bridges of um, of less exclusivity and more um, looking at... uh, parallels, continuity, compatibility, and so forth as we move into a new century. Um, I think, and just to go back um, to what John was saying before about um, feeling a responsibility to the past and to the people of the past, um, we picked two um, verses from the Doctrine and Covenants to put at the beginning of our book that we felt really captured um, our goals as well as our um, sort of spiritual uh, desires for doing such a project. And um, and one of them, Doctrine and Covenants 9816, um, echoes Malachi, where he says, therefore renounce war and proclaim peace and seek diligently to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers and the hearts of the fathers to their children. And as John was saying, we felt this desire as the children to turn our hearts to our fathers. And instead of, you know, saying we're at war with you, you're other, we wanted to make peace with them and say we respect your contribution and we respect your inheritance and we're grateful for um, in your sacrifice and your faith. And we also um, chose Doctrine and Covenants 128.18 um, and we said, which says, for, and this is an excerpt from it, so a rather long verse, um, for it is necessary in the ushering in of the dispensation of the fullness of time, which dispensation is now beginning to usher in that a whole and complete and perfect union and welding together of dispensations and keys and powers and glories should take place and be revealed from the days of Adam even to the present time. And so we saw our 
work as being part of this ongoing work of the restoration of looking to the past dispensations and saying how can we see ourselves as more whole and complete and perfect union with the past as we kind of look toward the future and so I, I just wanted to, to point that out as sort of echoing John's um, thought. That's Miranda Wilcox. Her and John Young join me today on the Maxwell Institute podcast. We're talking about their new book, Standing Apart, Mormon Historical Consciousness and the Concept of Apostasy. And the book's available now. You can pick it up on Amazon. Do you know if they're going to do an ebook? Uh, there, There is a Kindle version available now. Okay. I noted yesterday. Uh, and there's also it's a, the Google Play uh, bookstore has an electronic version of it too so you can get it now uh, electronically oh good that, that's a less expensive option or the hard cover is really expensive the soft cover is not as expensive whichever you choose uh, i really think uh, folks ought to pick up this book and sit down with it and and consider it i, I think it's a great contribution to mormon studies and i'm really glad that both of you took the time to talk about it today thank you very much thank you, thank you.